Howdy, howdy. Tis Chris Clements with another podcast. So we're going to talk about ionic compounds. It's going to be pretty quick with this one. So the first thing we need to discuss is that when compounds are making, <laughs> it takes either metals to non-metals or non-metals to non-metals. What we're going to focus upon today are ionic compounds, which if you have me as a teacher, you've learned that ionic compounds are generally made up of metals bonded to nonmetals. So let's talk a little bit about stability. Stability of an atom or of an ion, as I'll explain in a little bit, relates to its nobility, to how many valence electrons it has, and how close it is to being a noble gas. Every element really dreams when it goes to sleep of being a noble gas and they all strive to get there. So what they want to do is if they can't really be a noble gas, they want to look like one at least and that's how they attain what's known as a pseudo noble gas electron configuration. Now what I need you to focus upon at this point is learning two concepts called the duet rule and the octet rule. Those tell us that there are some elements that like to have two valence electrons around them because they like to look like helium. And then there are some elements that like to have eight valence electrons around them because they like to look like every other noble gas other than helium. So I need you essentially just to note that the first five elements, those being hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron, do everything they can to try to obey the duet rule. They want to look like helium. Every other element that we will encounter will try to obey the octet rule. Again, having eight valence electrons. There is potential energy that is involved in a chemical bond. So once a chemical bond is made and a compound is made, that energy that holds them together is called potential energy. You may have also heard of potential energy as stored energy. And that means that there's energy that holds, in this case, the ions together. And if we break apart a compound, it releases energy. So the energy that's required to break that bond apart is known as bond energy. Uh -huh. No trick in there. If energy is absorbed when the bond is broken, then we know that we have to put energy into the bond. And then if I tell you energy is released when the bond is formed, then as those ions come together, they give us energy. We'll talk a little bit later about energy. I just wanted to get that in for right now. The stronger a bond is, the more stable it is, which means it translates into re requiring more energy to break it. So ionic bonds are stronger than non-ionic bonds. Therefore, we find those weaker bonds that are less stable and require less energy to break them in molecular compounds. A uh, synonym for molecular compounds are covalent compounds, by the way. Again, we're going to focus today on ionic compounds. I'm going to try to be quick with this one. I'll probably speak rather quickly, but you just pause it as you need to, okay? Alrighty, ionic bonds are going to be made when atoms transfer electrons. They have two choices. They can gain an electron, they can lose an electron. So I want you to look at your periodic table, look at some metals, and think about what will metals do in order to reach stability. Look at sodium. Does it want to gain any more electrons or does it want to lose any electrons? Well, you should be telling yourself it has one valence electron. I bet it wants to lose that valence electron. Take a look at aluminum. Yep, it doesn't really want to gain any more either. It has three valence electrons. It probably wants to lose three electrons. So metals will lose electrons. Look at some nonmetals. Look at fluorine. It has seven valence electrons. It certainly doesn't want to lose any of those seven. It's so close to being a noble gas, it just wants to gain one more. Look at sulfur. It's two away from being a noble gas. It just wants to gain two electrons and be stable if it can. So nonmetals will gain electrons. Once an atom gains or loses electrons, it's known as an ion. So an ion is a charged atom. And their charges are either positive or negative, depending upon whether they have respectively lost electrons or gained electrons. Positively charged ions are called cations. 
they are positively charged because they involve an atom that has lost electrons. Remember, electrons are negatively charged. So if I lose negative things, it makes me more positive. If I gain negative things, as in nonmetals gaining electrons, then I become negatively charged. And negatively charged ions are called anions. It's not pronounced anion, it's anion. Cation and anion. And a cation will bond with an anion to make an ionic compound. And another name for an ionic compound, as I've told you before, is a salt. Salts, for our purposes at this point, are going to be a little more complex. They're going to be made of metals and nonmetals, or we're going to add some polyatomic ions into the mix. Salts are solid at room temperature. They have a very organized arrangement that's known as a crystal lattice. We'll talk about it a little bit later. They are brittle, which means if I were to hit a salt with a hammer, it would shatter. It would not dent like a metal would. They have very high melting points. And they're good conductors of electricity in aqueous and molten phases. Molten's just another word for melted. So if I dissolve any ionic compound in water, it will conduct electricity. Think of electric eels. They only work in salt water. They don't work in fresh water. Okay. When we write formulas of ions, we write a symbol of an element, and then as a superscript to the right, we write what's known as its charge. A charge is written as a number followed by a sign, positive or negative, depending upon whether it's a cation or anion. A lot of folks will write these differently and put the sign and then the number. That is not known as an ionic charge. That is known as an oxidation number and it is a different concept. So a charge is properly written as a number followed by a sign. Monatomic ions, you'll hear me mention, are one-atomed ions. Polyatomic ions are many-atomed ions. You need to print my polyatomic ion sheet that is on my website. If you've not already done so, pause the podcast and print that polyatomic ion sheet. You will need it momentarily. If you're in my class, I've already gone over valence electrons based upon the location of what are known as the representative elements on the periodic table, those being groups 1, 2, and 13 through 18. So my students should at this point be able to look at a periodic table and determine the number of valence electrons in each of those groups. As I move across from left to right, group 1 elements have one valence electron, group 2 have two valence electrons, group 13 have three, 14, 4, 15, 5, 16, 6, 17, 7, and 18, except for helium, have eight valence electrons. Helium only has two. So what we then realize, if we put these bits of information together, is that metals, which tend to hmm, have a lower number of valence electrons, therefore they want to give up electrons to look like a noble gas, will have positive charges. Nonmetals, which tend to have a higher number of valence electrons, will end up having negative charges. The names of ions aren't terribly complex at this point. Group 1, 2, 13, and then some of the elements in group 14 will just have element names plus ion. Group 15, 16, and 17 elements, the anions that are made, the nonmetals, will change their names so that they become eyed. So what I'm going to do is give you the names of the elements that change their names. I want you to understand that group 1 elements with one valence electron will lose one valence electron. So everyone in group 1 will have a one positive charge when it becomes an ion. So for example, lithium ion is called the lithium ion and it's written as Li with a superscript to the right of one positive. Aluminum in group 13 becomes aluminum ion, Al3 positive. We skip group 14 because it contains metals and nonmetals, and we get a little wishy-washy in there. We'll come back to some of the elements in there. Group 15 elements have five valence electrons, therefore it's easier for them to gain three electrons than it is to give up five, so they'll get a three negative charge, and their anion 
names will end in "-ide". So, if you're looking at a periodic table, then find group 15 elements, and we're going to start by going down group 15, and I'm going to tell you the names of the anions. Nitrogen becomes nitride, and its formula is N3 negative. Phosphorus becomes phosphide, and it is P3 negative. Arsenic becomes arsenide, and its char excuse me, its formula is AS3 negative. We won't look at antimony and bismuth as being anions because they're actually metals. Remember that metalloid little stair step thing? So antimony and bismuth are actually considered to be more metallic. If we look at group 16, you have oxygen with six valence electrons at the head of that group. It wants to just gain two more electrons. So everyone in group 16 will have a two negative charge. Again, going over their names since they do change. Oxide is O2 negative. Sulfide is S2 negative. Selenide is SE2 negative. Telluride is TE2 negative. And polonium tends to behave as a metal. And then group 17 elements have seven valence electrons, so they just want to gain one more. And group 17 elements are called fluoride, F1 negative, chloride, Cl1 negative, bromide, Br1 negative, iodide, I1 negative, and astatide, though there's not enough of it for us to even worry about. <laughs> So, those are your anion names. Now, what I've given you here are transition metals. And there are lots more transition, I can't speak, lots more transition metals than you see on these slides, but these are the more common ones and the ones that we will need to focus upon. So, we will have what are known as stock names and classical names. Both are still in use. The stock names are much easier. They have Roman numerals that tend to tell you the charge possibilities. They're called transition metals because they kind of go all over the place as to what their charges can be. So what I've given you on these slides are more common charges of some of the more common transition metals and you need to commit these to memory just as you do the others. So we have Cr2 positive, as you see, chromium 2 ion or chromus, Cr3 positive, chromium 3 ion or chromic, manganese 2 positive, manganese 2 ion or manganus, manganese 3 positive, manganese 3 ion or manganic, Fe2 positive, iron 2 ion or ferrous ion, Fe3 positive, iron 3 ion or ferric ion. On the next slide, CO2 positive is cobalt 2 ion or cobaltus. CO3 positive is cobalt 3 ion or cobaltic. Ni2 positive is nickel 2 ion or nicholas. Isn't that cute? <laughs> Ni3 positive is nickel 3 ion or nickelic. Even cuter. Cu1 positive is copper 1 ion or cuprous. Cu2 positive is copper 2 ion or cupric. Mercury is a weird one. Its ions have the same charge, but one of them is diatomic and one of them is monatomic. Yep, it's a weirdo. So, Hg2 with a 2 positive charge is called mercury 1 or mercurus. An Hg2 positive with no subscript is called mercury 2 or mercuric. I'll give you some more tidbits on that a little bit later. Next slide we have 10 Sn2 positive called 10 2 ion or stannous ion. Sn4 positive, 10 4 ion or stannic ion. Pb2 positive, lead 2 ion or plumbus ion. And Pb4 positive, lead 4 ion or plumbic. 
Now, there are three common transition metals that carry only one charge. Those are the silver ion, which is Ag1 positive, the zinc ion, Zn2 positive, and the cadmium ion, Cd2 positive. I recommend doing uh, flashcard type things to work on memorizing these. This is just as bad as memorizing your symbols, which you of course already know and have not let leave your memory banks, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, next slide tells you to refer to a handout for polyatomic ions. As I instructed a little bit ago, you need to have printed my polyatomic ion sheet. You need to know the formula of each of those polyatomic ions and its name. So the formula is the elements involved with the subscripts and the charge, and you need to know the name of those polyatomic ions. So what we are about to do is piece all this together to work on writing formulas and naming formulas. When we make ionic compounds, we have a cation and an anion that will bond in order to bring the charge of the compound to be zero. So if I have a cation with a one positive charge and an anion with a one negative charge, and I bring those two together, I think you can understand that I get a net charge of zero, and that means I only need one of each ion. But if I have a cation with a two positive charge and an anion with a one negative charge, when I bring those two together, I don't get zero when I add my charges together. So it means I need to do a little tweaking so that I will be able to add my total charges up and get zero. What you should be able to reason is if I have a two positive cation and a one negative anion, then I will need another one negative anion to make that work. And that means I will have a one to two ratio of cation to anion. Well, I teach you an easy method to do this called a crisscross method so that you can determine what the subgroups will be that need to balance the charges. What I want you to make certain that you do is reduce your subscripts in any ionic compound. You will always reduce subscripts in ionic compounds. So if you're looking at the active PowerPoint, you're gonna see things pop up. If you're just looking at printed sheet or at what I have here, it's not as beneficial as it is in class, so I'm not gonna take as much time with it. I'm gonna lead you a little bit through it, but this is really, something that that needs to be done in process so if you look at my active PowerPoint it's a little better than looking at the way I have it on this podcast because as you see on this slide I'm showing you making ionic compounds and what I've done is put up a sodium ion and in a box so you highlight it I've shown you the charge of sodium is one positive and a chloride ion and again highlighting its charge for you as a boxed item is one negative. What I mean by the crisscross method is that the number associated with the charge of the cation will come down as a subscript of the anion and the number associated with the charge of the anion will come down as a subscript of the cation. So that you see I have one and one respectively as sodium and chlorine uh, subscripts. Well it becomes NaCl then where you don't see the ones. We never write ones as subscripts. We discussed this a little bit earlier as we were doing some representative particle stuff. So as I look at the next one, you have Mg, which is two positive, with chloride that is one negative. You do your crisscross and stuff, and you end up with MgCl2. Look at Al and Cl, and you see a similar concept. Well, on the next slide, what I've done is show you how they're named. So NaCl, you name each ion. It's just sodium and chloride ion, so it's called sodium chloride. MgCl2 is called magnesium chloride. AlCl3 is called aluminum chloride. Going a little bit further, you see what I've pieced together here. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through this because it's a process and you can watch it come to fruition in active PowerPoint or you can see what I've done with my crisscrossing. Now all this crisscrossing business that I'm doing on here, I don't really expect to see once you get going on this. I certainly don't write down crisscrossing stuff. I can crisscross it in my head. I don't have to see it written. And you should be able to do the same thing. So as I look at the formulas on this slide and move to the next slide, I know that Na2S is called sodium sulfide, MgO, magnesium oxide, and Ca3P2, calcium phosphide. Moving on to a little 
different concept here. I have PB with a four positive charge and O with a two negative charge. When I crisscross, I have PB two O four. But remember, I told you you always reduce subscripts on any ionic compound, so you end up with PBO two. When you have silver ion and iodide ion, AGI. Ferric ion, Fe three and O two negative. You have Fe two O three. I can't reduce either of those two last ones. They're already reduced. So PBO2 is called lead 4 oxide. It's one choice of its name, or plumbic oxide. Either name works. AGI is called silver iodide, not silver 1 iodide, you notice. And Fe203 is called iron 3 oxide or ferric oxide. You should be able to go back and forth, meaning if I give you ferric oxide, you should be able to reason what its formula will be. You kind of do this crisscrossing thing where you go ferric is three positive, oxide is two negative, I crisscross, I come up with Fe203. When I'm looking at the formula and coming up with the name, I kind of reverse crisscross. So as I look, for example, at Fe203, I bring that two up as a charge of oxide, and I know it'll be negative. Cations are always written first, then anions. And I bring that three up as a charge of Fe, and I know its charge is therefore three positive. Well, remember, there are multiple charges of Fe, so I have to figure out which one it is when I look at the formula. So you should be asking yourself when you look at an ionic compound, does it contain a transition metal? And if it does, realize you may have to do a little more thinking to figure out what the name of that metallic ion is. Alrighty, as you look at putting in complex uh, stuff here, check out your polyatomic ion sheet. So on this slide, I've shown you PB4 positive with OH1 negative, and you're seeing parentheses here that you've not seen before. If you have a subscript that is applied via the crisscross method to a polyatomic ion, you must use parentheses. If you don't have a subscript that is applied via the crisscross method, you do not have to use parentheses. So as you look at crisscrossing the charge of the PB and the OH ions, you end up with 1 and 4 as your subscripts, so it does end up reading PB, OH, and then a 4 outside of the parentheses. The parentheses are necessary to show us we have 4 oxygens and 4 hydrogens. When I look at magnesium and SO4, 2 negative, I do my crisscrossing and my subscripts are 2 and 2. Do not ever mess with the subscripts on a polyatomic ion that are inside the parentheses. That is a no-no but you do notice that I reduce the 2 and 2 so that my formula is MgSO4. When I mix Al3 positive and C2O4 2 negative, again, parentheses around the C2O4, the charge is outside of the parentheses. Do your crisscrossing thing. You notice I've cleaned it up on this slide. And you end up with Al2. You hear me pause to indicate parentheses because we don't really need to say parentheses, parentheses, parentheses. So you have Al2. C2O4, 3. The name of PbOH4 is either lead 4 hydroxide or plumbic hydroxide. The name of MgSO4 is magnesium sulfate. Notice no Roman numeral, no ick or us stuff. The name of Al2 C2O4, 3 is aluminum oxalate. Again, I don't have to do Roman numerals or us and ick endings unless it's a transition metal that has that kind of ending. So what you have to do is get a practice sheet printed and work on writing some formulas and writing some names. That's all there is to it. Practice is the key. I'm going to do one last little bit here, and that is talk about that crystal lattice that I mentioned earlier. Crystal lattices are what make up solids. Solids can be ionic compounds that can be metals, that can be nonmetals. So we'll see crystal lattice in any solid, but we can have, have atoms or ions in that solid. The simplest part of a crystal lattice is known as a unit cell. Now there's six types of unit cells that are known as crystal systems. The only one I'm going to show you here is the one that's easiest for you to visualize and for me to draw and for you to draw if you need to. We're going to focus on the cubic unit cell. So of cubic unit cells, there are three types. There's a simple, a body-centered, and a face-centered. And in a simple cubic unit cell, 
<clears throat> you should see that we have what ends up being a quarter of, um, I'm sorry, an eighth of, oh, I misspoke there, an eighth of an atom. Take a look at that shape. Envision taking a sphere, cutting it in half, cutting it in half again, cutting it in half again. You have an eighth of an atom at each corner or vertex of the cube. This is exemplified by the element phosphorus. Uh, one form, one allotrope of phosphorus has a simple cubic unit cell structure so that there is a net number of atoms in every cube of one because if I have eight corners in a cube and an eighth of an atom at each corner, that gives me a net of one phosphorus atom in that cubic space. Whereas if I look at a more complex unit cell, the face-centered unit cell, it's exemplified by sodium chloride, you'll notice that at each vertex here, I have an eighth of a sodium ion. And at the joint of two faces, I have a fourth of a chloride ion. Well, hmm, take a look at it. I end up with a net of four chloride ions and a net of four sodium ions. Hmm. Same number of each ion. Makes sense because the formula is NaCl. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. And in a body-centered cubic unit cell, exemplified by cesium chloride, you have, in this particular illustration, one whole cesium ion in the smack dab middle of the cube and an eighth of a chloride ion at each vertex. That's a net of one chloride ion to one cesium ion. Okay, if you take chemistry two, we do a lot more with this, but it's just neat to kind of see how they, how they build their structures. Alrighty, now I told you this one would be kind of short. It ends up being pretty darn short and you now need to just practice your tails off. I cannot tell you how much it helps just to do it again and again and again. And we will spend a lot of time on this because you really can't get further along in chemistry until you can write formulas. So that's your duty from this point on. Alrighty, hope you enjoyed and look forward to doing more. Thanks. Bye.